up some of your time to come and listen to our webinar around racquetball. Um, so, so hopefully most of you would have seen we've started to um, promote some tools and resources for clubs to utilise racquetball in their club to, to grow membership and participation, uh, not just through racquetball, but also into squash as well. So today we'll sort of run through um, some of those resources and what we've got available at the moment and the support that we can offer for clubs that want to want to get stuck in and offer that to members. Um, we're also uh, lucky to have Patrick Osborne with us today. So Patrick is the chair of the World Squash Federation Squash 57 Commission. Is that correct, Patrick? Did I get that right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So Patrick will talk to us a bit later on about um, how racquetball or squash 57 is getting played in the UK um, and also how it's um, growing around the world with some other uh, national federations as well, um, starting to roll it out. And we've also got Stuart Martin as well, who is development manager for Squash Auckland, who shares some some of the things that um, Squash Auckland have been doing in the past, probably 18 months to to grow racquetball um, with some initiatives um, and some competitions and things that are that are coming up as well this year. So, hi Stuart. Good evening. Excellent. So this will be recorded as well. Um, we'll put it up on uh, Facebook, uh, YouTube, and then through Facebook as well, so those that couldn't make it can can tune in. So let's get into it. Right. Um, so obviously the first question to cover is what is racquetball? So this is the same game as Squash 57. Um, so there's sort of the two different names and they're trying to get um, those sort of combined and getting a sort of a, a standard brand across the world. Um, obviously, racquetball sort of originates from the UK. I'm sure Patrick could probably go into the origins of it. Um, but when we talk about racquetball, we are talking about Squash 57 and the Squash 57 rules that have been put in place by World Squash. So yeah, whenever we talk about it, that's that's what we mean. So racquetball, it's played on a squash court, which is obviously perfect for us. We're all, all at squash clubs um, and helping to run those in, in various capacities. Um, it's easy to pick up, it's great fun, and of course it provides, it provides a good cardio workout. Um, and why is that? Well, it uses a, a bigger bouncier ball, um, and there's a bigger racket than squash. So of course it means that players have more time to reach the ball, being being bouncier, and it's a lot easier to hit back. So really, whatever the level of the players, they can enjoy longer rallies and more, more action on court. Um, it does provide an easy introduction to squash, um, so it is... Um, ideally suited to beginners. Um, many two people can really come in off the street, not have played any racket sports before, and we'll be able to to get a rally going um, using using this gear. Um, I think we've all sort of tried playing squash in our in our early days in the middle of winter with a dead ball that's just not bouncing anywhere, and that's not particularly enjoyable for most of us. So um, any any weather racket ball, um, you're good to get get rallies going from from the start. Um, also, sort of players at the other end of the careers can sort of help extend that um, by offering a less intensive alternative to squash. Uh, it'll keep people on the court into their later years. So we know there's a, a lot of the players that are in Auckland at the moment that currently play are uh, sort of squash players in the, in the twilights of their careers, um, whether they think so or not. You can sort of we'll leave that up to them to decide. Uh, but we do know that a lot of players sort of migrate out to the tennis courts as well, but racquetball can keep these players on the court, get them playing a lot longer. Obviously, if we can retain them on the squash court, then that means that we can keep retaining those memberships, um, that revenue coming into our clubs. Um, schools also transfer well for tennis players. Um, obviously, the, the, the size of the head uh, or the shape of the head of the rackets is, is very similar. And we also know as well from some of the demo nights that have been done around Auckland, that those that were done at rackets clubs where there's tennis courts as well, there was a good turnout from tennis players who thoroughly enjoyed it too. So. Yeah, rather than losing those squash players out to tennis, we can potentially bring more tennis players into the squash courts, particularly in the, the middle of winter when it's pouring with rain every day and blowing a gale. So that's a, a basic outline of, of racquetball. I'm sure Patrick will um, correct me on anything that I get wrong later on, but we'll just yeah, we'll see how we get on. So why, why racquetball? So why would we look to introduce this um, into New Zealand and try and get it running around our clubs and get players involved? So there's three key things. So it's easy to start, fun to play, and hard to stop. So this table here kind of sort of shows some of the impact on, on different parts of a club that it can improve. So we talk about revenues. So can it improve revenues? And that's through increased memberships, um, increased bar turnover. Uh, diversity. So we sort of know that 
squash membership is made up of predominantly males. Um, so this can sort of help bring in plenty of females players. As it said, it's a great introduction for the sport. Um, also quite a leveler as well. So um, plenty of competitive matches across juniors are there. Uh, juniors also, so uh, easy for them to pick up um, and get straight into it. Um, we know that a lot of the, the younger juniors in particular can struggle. So it gives them that bounce of your ball and the bigger racket makes it easy to have contact. Um, and once again, get more rallies going and get them enjoying the game a lot quicker. Um, on capacity as well, so it can, um, it doesn't have an impact on, it's obviously played on existing squash courts, so it can help sort of grow utilization of squash facilities. It's easy to learn, so people may be more likely to be retained in the sport rather than sort of trying it and maybe slipping away because they haven't had a great experience. Um, and sort of doubles as well. So we'll talk about doubles racquetball and the variations to squash doubles as well. Um, that sort of ticks a whole lot of boxes. Um, and while it may look a bit foreign to pretty much everyone, I'm not sure that many would have seen doubles racquetball played before, but um, it's certainly a, a different experience. And yeah, it's certainly fun that's got four players on a court all moving at the same time. And um, yeah, I'm sure once people start playing it, they'll really enjoy that. So. As I said, easy to start, so easy to learn, it takes all the boxes, um, inexpensive equipment. Um, so typically the rackable rackets can be bought for under $100. Um, so most people know that squash rackets can be sort of anywhere between 200 and 300 for a good one. So if people are looking to add on racquetball to their, sort of their squash play, it's not hugely expensive just to, to buy a racket or even just for new players that don't want to fork out, fork out hundreds of dollars, they can get in at a good entry point. So we just play on existing squash courts, we've all got squash courts. There's all times of the day when, when they're going to be quiet, so we can use racquetball to, to fill up those quiet times and make sure they are being used. Um, and the fun to play, so obviously it's sort of a heavy emphasis on, on strategy. Um, the, the racket skills, there's, I've seen some, some good racquetball sh shots played out there that would, would beat most people, but there is a, a big emphasis on the strategy and move your, your opponent around the court knowing that sort of a bit harder to hit that neck or, or get some good length that sort of bounces up a lot. So, yep, we can um, tick a lot of boxes there. Obviously, it's more aerobic versus power. Um, so those that sort of have the power squash game may not like it so much with the balls flying flying out of the court and, and everywhere, but obviously more emphasis on that aerobic part. So, so longer rallies um, and, yeah, a, a better workout and, and a lot of fun as well while you're running around the, <laughs> the squash court. Um, increased competition opportunities. Um, of course, we'll talk about some of the things that we're going to be looking at doing later on. But obviously, there's a lot of a lot of chances there to for clubs to set up fun business house competitions, um, inter club um, challenges. Um, or still, we'll talk about some tournaments that uh, Squash Auckland are looking at setting up this year. Um, there's some charity a charity teams event, the the Packer Cup, which has been going for a couple of years as well. And then we're doing a a big racquetball festival um, in August in Auckland as well. So having a bit of a pathway there. So players, it's not just there. There is things that they do enjoy playing it and want to want to carry on that they can take part in those. And obviously having a heavy emphasis on the, the social and fun side of it. Um, hard to stop. Obviously talk can extend playing career. Um, and yeah, obviously we'll keep keep players going, which keeps keeps that capacity at the courts going and the revenues coming in the longer if we can retain those players. So some good examples here of um, the benefits that the clubs can have from offering it and for players getting involved with it. Uh, so we'll just go into a couple of the differences on uh, between squash and racquetball first. Um, the service is probably the main one. So I'll try and explain this well. Once again, Patrick, <laughs> feel free to correct me. Um, so before being served, the ball gets dropped, so it bounces once. So obviously squash, the ball isn't hitting the ground, just hitting it, throwing it straight into the racket. So the ball bounces once. The ball must be served directly onto the front wall between the tin and the out of court line at the top. So the service line along the middle of the court, like it needs to be served above and squash, doesn't come into play at all. It just needs to be anywhere above the tin and below the outline at the top. Uh, and then for the receiver, so on its return from the front wall, the ball has to fall into the back quarter of the court opposite to the service box before hitting the back wall. So we've got a little diagram here as well. So we can see on the left hand side the racket with the server. So the ball comes across and must land in that green area there. So very similar to squash. 
However, there is one difference that if the serve hits the back wall before before hitting the floor or hits the floor outside of that quarter, so it comes up short of the line, the receiver can try and play the ball and the rally continues. But if the receiver does not try and play that ball, then the server has a second service. So that is if the ball hits the back wall on the full or lands short without landing in that back quarter box, then the server can have another shot. If the second service is then a fault, then it becomes a double fault and the receiver wins that point. So main difference for the server, the ball has to bounce once and it can hit anywhere on the front wall above the tin and the outer court line. And for the receiver, the ball has to land in the back quarter. They can play it if it does come off the back wall, they can play it and the rally continues. But if they choose to let it go, then they can have a second service from that. Right, be clear as mud. But coming up next, we've got a bit of a video. So hopefully that might clarify it. So this is a an oldie bit of goodie from England squash about racquetball, um, featuring a fairly famous English player who's well known for playing a lot of racquetball as well. So I'll bring this up and we'll get this played. Racquetball is easy to learn, easy to learn, and great fun for all ages. It's played on the squash. The main difference is the racket heads and the ball is bigger, which makes it bounce more and easier to hit. 40 minutes, you get a great workout, loads of calories. These are the basics to get you started. The ball is played below the top line, top line and above the bottom line is also called the tin. But before you start, warm yourself up and the ball. When serving, one foot must be inside the box and the ball must bounce first. The server has two chances to play the ball in the opposite quarter, but the ball lands in front of the short line or hit the wall before bouncing, the opponent can choose whether or not to play. You can play the ball on the bounce or the volley, as long as it stays within the court. After the shot, try to get back to the T-zone. That will give you your best position. At points, you either make the ball impossible to play or force an error. And the ball can only bounce once. Once you've played your shots, you must try to get out of the ball and your opponent so they can play their shots. Generally, if you don't, that's called a stroke and they win. If you try but can't, that's a let and play the point again. Whoever wins the point serves. Scores 11 wins the game, but. 10 all, you must win by two points. It's the best of five games that will match. For more details, check out the website. So get out and start playing. Excellent. Good. Cool. Um, forgot to mention, if anyone has questions, they can plug them into the chat at any time. I've got Tyler monitoring those and she can feed them back to me. But just before we go into doubles, I might just sort of pause for a second and see if there are any questions um, that people have around around those rules there. Cool. Cool. If you think of anything as well, I said just pop it into the chat and we can we can come back to it at some stage. Okay, doubles racket ball. Now the difference here between squash and uh, racket ball is racket ball is played with alternate shots. So it means that all four players are involved in the game for equal amount of time and obviously brings a few different strategies. Um, I've got another video coming up as well, which might explain it um, a bit better sooner. But essentially, there's the diagram here. So most of the players are lining up down the centre line. I guess the key with this one is that it's a case of trying to play the ball and then get to the back of the court rather than the traditional play the ball and, and get back to the tee. If you try and do that with doubles racket ball, um, you're going to get get yourself into all sorts of trouble. So I kind of explain some of the rules and then we'll go into the video, which which will help sort of clarify that for everyone. So it's mentioned alternate shots um, for serving. So each team nominates its server for the first game um, and that player will serve for the whole of the game one and game three um, if we're playing a five game match. Then the other player obviously serves for game two and four. Um, if you're playing best of three, then first serve would play do the first one and the second serve for the second game. Uh, the key is in the in the final game, so whether that's the third or the fifth game, 
when the first side score reaches five, um, if you're playing up to 11, then the server changes. So the idea being that everyone serves for the same amount of time. And alternatively, if you're playing up to 15, then you'd swap when the score gets to, to seven. So key point there is one person serves for the whole of the game for that team. Uh, on the return of service and subsequent play, so at the beginning of each game, each team decides which one of its players will receive service from the right-hand side and which one from the left-hand side. So once again, people are just picking which side they're going to receive from from that whole game. Um, let's, um, so basically, um, not, not many strokes, you can imagine with four people on the court. Um, probably one other thing to point out is that all racquetball doubles is played on a squash court. Um, so uh, the doubles, the wider doubles courts um, aren't used. So um, yeah, it means the proper version can be played on, on any squash court. Um, if a play is hindered by its own partner, then there's no let and the rally is lost. Otherwise, uh, lets are played for, for all interference otherwise. So we go into the next slide. So this is a bit of an exhibition of squash of racquetball doubles here, um, which features Nick Matthews. Um, so yeah, this is a so sort of at the, at the higher end of it, but you can sort of give you a good a good view of how it is played. So I'll just play this for a minute or so. As you can see, a little bit different and obviously brings quite a few new strategies into the game. So um, we actually played this a week ago at the National Squash Centre with the Squash New Zealand team. And uh, yeah, we thoroughly enjoyed it. We managed to pick it up pretty easily, um, other than one player who I won't name. But um, yeah, it's good fun. As you can see, everyone's on the go the whole time. So it's um, yeah, it makes for a very fun and social <laughs> competition. Cool. Um, so, was, was there any questions about the doubles? I'm sure there probably is, but uh, I think it's one of the cases of sort of getting on and, and giving it a go. Um, but yeah, was there anything anyone want to bring up at the moment? Cool. Excellent. All right. Well, well, that was my brief introduction on on the game. Um, so now I'll hand over to the expert, um, Patrick Osborne. And he can sort of critique my description of, of how racquetball is played and yeah, can share us some insights on on how it's going around the world. So Patrick. Thank you very much, John. Uh, I thought that was a great uh, explanation of how the game, the rules of the game and how it's played. So uh, I'm just going to try and supplement that with what's going on around the world uh, as we see it. Um, this is uh, just obviously a map of the world, and, and this is trying to explain what our target audience is. So as John said, the game is played on a squash court. It's on a single squash court, both, both the singles and doubles. So anywhere that there's a squash court, there's an opportunity to grow the sport. Um, and the colors here are the blues are where squash 57 is being played today. Uh, and the greens are where there are squash courts. So that gives an idea of where we're trying to grow the game. From a, a history standpoint, 
there's a timeline on the bottom left hand side of this slide. Um, the American uh, racquetball game started in uh, 1950, so 25 years or so before uh, racquetball started in the UK. Um, so in 1976, we started playing it in the UK and in 1984, so about 20 years later, England squash recognized the game and we had nationals. So we've had nationals in the UK since 1984. Um, so there's quite a bit of history, and and if you go to the UK racquetball site, you can there's uh, I guess all the archives of of uh, who won what um, if you're interested in that. In 2016, the World Squash Federation and England Squash, I think, were heavily involved as well. They rebranded uh, UK racquetball to Squash 57, and the the main reason behind this, uh, though there might be many other reasons, the main reason, as far as I can see. Um, is that racquetball is already being played in a number of countries. So wherever we have discussions about squash 57 in, say, the Americas, uh, if you're calling the game racquetball, you're going to get into confusion. And we've certainly had examples of people running hybrid uh, tournaments where they're running both racquetball and squash 57, and they've called it UK racquetball, and they've had to give refunds because people turn up with the wrong equipment um, expecting to play something else. Um, in 2021, so last year, uh, Canada got involved and pushed out a webinar like you're having here today. Uh, and they're heavily pushing uh, Squash 57 across all of the Pan American regions. So Lolly Gillen's involved with that. Um, and we're seeing a lot of activity now um, throughout uh, the Americas. And we've got the New Zealand webinar now. Uh, I think the different countries have had different approaches. And, and one uh, probably unique approach um, has come out of Belgium, where they have seeded um, 40 clubs with equipment. So for them, rather than hoping that it'll sort of evolve over time within Belgium, they've tried to kickstart the game and they've uh, seeded with a number of uh, rackets and balls uh, at 40 different clubs uh, in Belgium. If we can move on. This is the setup that we have in uh, England right now. So England Squash own the games of Squash and Squash 57, but they have delegated to UK Racquetball um, the major events uh, around England. Um, and these are the events that we have lining up for this year. So this is, uh, we, I guess, for the last 20 years or so, UK Racquetball has been involved in the I'll call it Squash 57 World in, in England, and they've been evolving a, a series of events. So this is um, the most evolved year. Um, we have about uh, nine or ten uh, regional events uh, that played around the UK. Um, and then we had the national singles, national doubles, and we also had a British Open that started last year uh, at Nick Matthews Club. Um, and that's going to have its second year this year. So that was a, a huge event last year. And you'll find um, lots of videos uh, with some top players, including Nick Matthew himself and Sarah Jane Perry. Um, this is all available on the Squash 57 uh, YouTube site. So this is the situation that we have. So every month there is a major event uh, being played. These events, apart from the um, ones in purple here, these events are one day events. Um, they tend to be round robin by age group, 10, 10 year categories. So we have an open event in over 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s um, events. Uh, you play round robin and depending on the numbers on each in each category, you'll have a like a semis and finals as well. But if you want the details about uh, how we do this, then uh, please ask. But I think that the point about um, Squash 57 is you can play multiple times a day so people may play six times on the one day which you i, I think you'll struggle to do at a squash a squash tournament uh, next slide please so what are the focus areas for the uh, the commission um three main areas i think that we're working on right now are the balls um so trying to get the manufacturers aligned with the balls so uh, I think in the videos you, you've seen both black and blue balls. Those are the those are the two colours that we have. And uh, squash has double yellow dot, single yellow dot, and a number of colours as well. So in squash 57 we have the two balls, black and blue. Black being less bouncy than the blue, um, but it's really up to the player's preference as to which one they would like to play with. I think for most of the events that we have in the UK, 
uh, it's the black ball that's being played, but depending on your mobility, uh, maybe the blue ball is more appropriate. Um, when I say we're trying to get the ball, uh, the manufacturers aligned, if you buy a black ball as a consumer, um, depending on the manufacturer, and there's about 10 manufacturers of balls, you might get a very different bounce from the ball. So we're trying to make sure that a black ball bounces like a black ball and a blue ball like a blue ball. So from a consumer standpoint, you know what you're buying. Uh, we're trying to uh, implement a coach's qualification. Um, so what we're starting with this year is a qualification for existing squash coaches. So it's like a top up um, and that will be available online through an e-learning platform. And we hope to have that in place uh, by third quarter this year. Uh, and then naturally, as events get larger, I mentioned we had the British Open and we we hope we had travellers coming in to play in that competition. And hopefully there'll be more, more of those over the years. Um, we're going to need to have uh, officials who are properly trained up to the rules of Squash 57 rather than playing uh, squash rules. Exhibition is a, an important one for us. Uh, wherever there's a, a major event, we're trying to get a at least an exhibition um, at that event. So whether like a squash masters event, there's invariably people who play squash 57 and would be able to give a demonstration. So we're trying to use uh, those events as a platform to to uh, show what can be done. And from an, uh, within the UK, we have uh, a couple of other um, initiatives taking place. One is about inclusivity. So U3A is, uh, is the university of the third age. These are people who are entering retirement or heading towards retirement. This is seen as a perfect sport for, for those people, maybe coming away from contact sports or other sports, um, not as mobile as they used to be. Uh, we, th we see this as a perfect op opportunity to engage with that generation uh, I'm included in that generation um, and there's also an interclub uh, I guess uh, competition that we're trying to build up within the within the UK so that's another initiative that's taking place so I think those are the the three slides that I have and um, I hand back to John and if there's questions we can probably take them now or later it's fine oh. uh, thanks Patrick for that um... Well, I see there's Squash 57 draws in the World Masters Games in the or the World Squash Games going forward. Or yeah, I, I think uh, there's there's no reason why this shouldn't be uh, run at all of these uh, major events. And uh, the Asia Pacific Masters Games uh, included Squash 57, so that was in 2019. Um, the uh, Asia Pacific Masters Games they're going to include Squash 57, and and they're hoping to expand it. So we're going to get. Uh, hopefully quite a bit of publicity at the Commonwealth Games. It'll be seen there. And I think the uh, African Games are going to be held in Ghana and Ghana will be at the Commonwealth Games and, and uh, hopefully picking up some some tips and some networking done there. So I think there's loads of opportunity to, to do stuff like this. Um, I, I think we've had been challenged uh, internally within the squash world um, when trying to get Squash 57 played as a parallel event at Masters events because Masters events are very busy and they run over multiple days. So to throw in on top of that another uh, discipline uh, is seen as uh, too much time required, too much court time would be required. So we haven't really gone past the demonstration side of this yet in a number of these events, but, but hopefully that will be picking up soon. I think when we talked the other day as well, you mentioned that the doubles is very popular. Most probably about the same number of entries for that. Yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah. Doubles is huge. It's it's a hugely entertaining, and, and as you were saying, it's played on a, a single squash court. You don't need a doubles squash court, um, and and actually you can play uh, if you do alternate shots with a with squash doubles. It works as well on a singles court, so um, it's not a, a unique thing necessarily to squash fifty seven. Um, but yes, it's it's certainly a, a number of clubs. Uh, more doubles is played than singles. It's very entertaining, and and I think um, it, you know, if if you're thinking doubles and mixed stability on a on a squash court, you might feel there's not a lot of uh, action taking place. But everybody takes their turn in playing, and you've got to think not just about your your abilities and and your uh, skill set. Um, but you've got to think about what your where your partner's strengths and weaknesses are and protect them or line them up for something and and also your opponents so you've got to 
you've got a lot of things to think about while you're playing uh, that game. Um, and, and something we found when introducing Squash 57 to clubs, certainly this, uh, my club, we did some analysis around uh, court bookings. And by just introducing the game, we increased our social bookings by 30%. So going back to the, the reasons for having this game, I think there's a very real reason for anyone with uh, squash facilities, squash courts, to, to seriously consider this because with no capital outlay, you can have Squash 57 at a squash club um, for the cost of a you know, $100 uh, dollar racket. Uh, you've suddenly got a 30% increase in your revenue streams. And, and quite often, it's, um, I guess, a more senior player who has a who has a, a, an income that that can be spent in the bar, right? So there are revenue streams here that, that really should be taken seriously. And how many record ball players would you say you would have in the UK? Yeah, that's a tricky question. I, I mean, <laughs> if you ask me how many squash players, I wouldn't be able to answer that one either. But <laughs> but I think, you know, the events that we run, they're they're all sellouts and uh, immediately. Um, there's and they're limited to about fifteen players per court at the venue. So if you have a four court venue running a, an event, uh, a one day event, um, everyone playing at least two games, maybe up to six games. Um, you're sort of restricted to about 15 players per court. So we have the, all these events are 60 players sell out uh, one day events. And then we have the nationals, which uh, 200 plus players um, turning up for a, week, a long weekend. So quite often they have to start on the Friday. So it's a three day event. But how many how many players I would I would say if you, you know, based on the um, the analysis around the courts, if you're increasing your social bookings by 30%, then maybe 30% are, is your number of players when you compare them to the squash numbers. Um, that's how I'd probably play that. Yeah, excellent. Did someone have a question I hear? Uh, yeah, we've got a couple of questions in the chat. Um, so is single, like in singles, 10 all, is it win by two in doubles? Yes. Yes, uh, both for singles and for doubles in, in every game, including the last game, it's uh, too clear. Awesome. And then probably a question for John. Where can we buy balls in New Zealand? Yep. So I'll touch on it later on, but we have some, we have racquetball kits um, available for clubs as an intro offer, which includes six rackets and nine balls. And Tyler and I are both currently working on an online shop. So we will have balls available very shortly that people will be able to buy online um, through us. So yep, they will be available. Um, if someone needs them straight away, then they can get in touch with me. Any other questions for Patrick? Was Squash Auckland put out a deal today for the racquetball starter kit because we bought one for Belmont? Yes, correct. So for the racquetball kits, so Auckland has a different deal with um, with Head, who are their, their sponsor. Um, the same with Midlands also have a deal, which they're running separately. But for any other clubs, um, yeah, they can come through through Squash New Zealand. And we, we just, as Patrick said, um, Belgium was sort of, just trying to get rackets as easily as possible into clubs and obviously to be able to grow this game and get it played we need people to have equipment so yep so clubs can can organize stuff through us and yeah it's a very shortly we'll be able to have rackets available for individuals i think there are a limited number of pro shops that have some gear um, but hopefully once the game starts growing that um, there'll be more more pro shops and it'll be easy easily accessible for those rackets hey john for squash new zealand what brand of rackets have you got so we have dunlop rackets so there are also I've seen some head ones available as well um, around the place, but then we yeah, we have a exclusive distribution offer with Dunlop for, for New Zealand for those. Yeah. So we'll be using the Dunlop board as well. Excellent. All right. Thank you, Patrick. It was it's great. Right, um, so next up we'll have Stuart um, from Squash Auckland who can sort of run through a few things that, um, that Squash Auckland have been doing to, to get racquetball up and running around the place. Stuart. Cool, thanks John. So a few things we've done around the place. Uh, I think the main one that we've really kind of got into a bit last year and is the demo nights. The whole point of these is just go into a club, book out a night, book out some courts. And 
myself or some other racquetball enthusiasts will come in with some equipment and just teach everyone how to play the game and it's just kind of easy stress-free environment so it's really just creating the awareness of the game for them, how to play so when you have someone come down asking about it people know what it is and they can help him through it just like you would for squash and um, yeah with that there's always going to be some naysayers and we found that convince him to come on court and majority have enjoyed it uh, cool um with that also kind of linking that and following that to get some regular exposure through club nights so they've had their demo night and they've got some equipment maybe they just make a one of the courts at club night that's just the racquetball court for the night and you can just kind of rotate through just keeping the awareness and just regular activity of racquetball going um other than that why and um, they've done a little bit of efforts fairly taken from what we have done with a bit of intro nights they've also run a couple fast eight competitions so just like a bit more of a challenging way to get people into it and learn about it and a bit more exhibitiony style and i think one of their big focuses of with us as well as ours is the the fun aspect so whether that comes from dressing up or music or whatever it is just keeping the fun aspect of racquetball there um so coming up this is actually on saturday we've got like a little aucklanders waikato challenge we've got a the Aucklanders going down to Hamilton to compete in that. So again, we're just going to have a very social day. Let's keep the fun aspect of racquetball there because that's what you want to do to keep people involved, especially as the new people are coming into racquetball. You want to make it fun. So along that, there's always things you can do like club challenges, things that people look forward to. And the Packet Cup is something that's been running at North Shore for the past two years and it's taken that team aspect and it's actually translated really well and that's actually the format that we're looking to use more often including the NZ Rackle Festival so nice and social the whole day and yeah just a good thing for people to look forward to um as far as this year goes we've got a few tournaments booked in like uh, Auckland teams and Auckland doubles later in the year so we'll be releasing that in due course but just again something to show that there is events going and something to play the game something to look forward to yep um, any questions about what I've just touched on cool excellent well, I think we've got a, a hand up from Fiona. Fiona, did you want to say anything or were you just saying hi? It might have just been a hi. I'll assume it was a hi then. Hi, Fiona. <laughs> Excellent. Cool. Um, so now we'll sort of we'll move on to to how can clubs implement this um, and and make it successful there. So there was some re, uh, an email that went out to clubs a couple of weeks ago with with a bunch of information um, that is come from the Squash New Zealand website. There's a separate racquetball page which has been populated with a whole lot of uh, resources, um, some of the videos that you've seen tonight, um, information about the equipment offer. Um, said some participation options um, and that's uh, as well as some some promotional material that they can use to, to offer it so I'll run through that quickly here what we've got but yeah key thing is um, if you're looking for the the information um, it's on the, the squash is on the website from the play squash then racquetball so what can we do so we already touched on that equipment offer as well so we are um, gear bags available for six rackets um, and nine balls for $399 um, just to get clubs up and running so a lot lower than the recommended retail price um, and a sort of a limited offer just to really I said, sort of seed it out there um, and get the equipment available 
So they can be ordered through the website. There's a link on that Rackball page. And yeah, hopefully in the next couple of days, we'll have sort of an online shop available where players will be able to buy rackets um, and balls themselves, or clubs can buy additional gear too. So yep, can't can't run the sport if we don't have the, the right equipment out there. Um, obviously, we can provide quotes as well for funding applications. So I've had chats with a couple of districts as well that may look at getting some funding applications to get some, some equipment going. So yeah, happy to, uh, help clubs um, with quotes if they want to put in applications to get that. Um, as Stuart sort of mentioned, what we did with the demo nights in Auckland was sort of making sure there was enthusiasts there. So people that played the game, um, really loved the game and that sort of enjoyment and enthusiasm will sort of spark other people to play. So if, you're, if your club is new to doing it um, and you have the, the equipment there and you find one or two people that are really keen on it, sort of utilize them as much as possible to sort of enthuse others. Um, and we can also, we're working with the districts as well to try and identify coaches or, or people that are maybe not your club, but in a nearby club that may be able to come and run a demo night for you. So we're sort of trying to build up a pool of people that are these enthusiasts that can help help grow it. Um, so demo nights, once again, sort of as Stuart said, sort of have equipment available um, for and some members there to, to help out. So once again, we sort of want to, as well as it's nice to sort of get some some current squash players maybe playing a bit of racquetball to get it up and running. We really want to target bringing new players in um, and use it as either a gateway to squash, um, so using it as an introductory, or players will continue to just carry on with squash 57 or racquetball um, if they wish, but also using it for those players that maybe once it is time to sort of pick up the, the squash racket that's racquetball is there as an available option as well. So, yeah, we don't want to just sort of go from shifting all our squash players into record players because that doesn't help grow grow capacity grow the revenues or anything but really use it to get a base up and running and then feed a lot of new players into it and grow and grow um, clubs that way so yeah it can be incorporated into regular club nights so whether it's one one court that's just played with racquetball with courts available um but yeah just making sure there's regular opportunities so people know if they enjoyed it they can come down the following week to club night and it'll be available again um, so racquetball programs, so these may be ones that coaches can may look at int um, introducing and uh, they may want to bring racquetball into existing coaching programs or they may want to run something completely separate. So a beginner racquetball competition um, or ladies only sessions. Um, there is a link to the UK racquetball website on our website as well. Um, that does have some great resource there as well. Um, so yeah, we'll try and utilize what success stories are out there and, and share those with everyone. Um, business house is another one. So I've heard from one of two clubs already who are going to look at running a business house competition, just utilizing racquetball. Um, once again, it's another way that you can use current members to bring in, introduce non-members, non-players um, through friends, family, work colleagues to take part in a, a fun competition. So most business house comps would sort of run over to four to six weeks, and then you can kind of use whatever format um, you may use at your club already in terms of sort of the team format and scoring methods. Uh, so, or if you can just keep it simple, look at something like the Packer Cup with teams of three players and then just play sort of best of three pass scoring. Um, fast eight draw. So this is basically a mini tournament. So this is something that we're going to sort of standardize in terms of rules across the country, not just for racquetball, but for squash as well. But there's a few, few districts that have already run a, a fair number of them. Um, Waikato being one and Southland have done a few as well. Basically just playing out a nature draw over a couple of hours um, with the matches of best of three and then par eight as well. So everyone can come along in an evening, book out a couple of hours and as I said, get plenty of time on court. Um, and sort of as Patrick said, you can sort of so those one day tournaments, you get could potentially have up to sort of six matches in a day in, in the UK. So getting those three matches just means a lot more time on the court for people as well. And they get to play a variety of people and so it's that sort of competitive streak being, being sort of in a competition draw. Um, and then, of course, doubles. So twice the social, twice the fun. Um, and obviously, probably a new learning experience for many people as well. So <laughs> very keen to see some videos of that played around the country. Um, so as well as that, there are some things to help um, clubs promote it if they do um, wish to to get involved and start offering it. So there are some posters there which clubs can use to promote sort of have a go nights or demo nights. Um, we've got a logo gallery, so you can see we're sort of developed a, a new racquetball logo, logo based on the squash New Zealand one and the same as the districts just to really bring that in and 
bring it in together and help people understand that it is under the, the Squash New Zealand banner. Um, we've got some social, social media tiles which clubs can use, sort of targeting, as they targeting sort of young young players or new players coming to the game as well as well as the old ones so sort of one of the main reasons that, that people would take out racquetball um, an image gallery as well there's a couple of case studies there's one from club k um, who have implemented it down there a few years ago and once again we'll start building up those case studies once um, it becomes a bit more ingrained in a few of the clubs and just a couple of brief faqs as well um, around around racquetball um, Stuart kind of briefly touched on sort of a tournament calendar. Um, so I guess from a club level, um, you can run internal club competitions, which may just be part of club night or business house. Um, club tournaments as well, much like clubs would run a squash tournament. Um, sort of the one day format we know works well. People are quite often quite busy to play play across a whole weekend, but a quick fire one day tournament with, with plenty of time on court um, would certainly be attractive to a lot of players. And then there's opportunities once there's enough players to have some of those inter-district challenges. So a fun day away from, from neighbouring districts, a team from Auckland going down to Waikato, a team from Southland going up to Otago. Um, so there's plenty of opportunities there. And the New Zealand Racquet, Racquetball Festival is um, what we're sort of all going to build up to this year. Um, so we have dates for that, which is going to be the 20th and 21st of August at Hearn Bay in Auckland. Um, it may be a Friday start, but it's likely we'll just run on the Saturday and potentially use um, a second venue as well. But the format of that is going to be a team's competition on day one. So teams of three once again, and social function on the Saturday evening, and then an individual competition on day two. So we're looking at packages for that at the moment, but it's likely that um, sort of the entry fee will be all inclusive of meals, lunch and dinners, um, things like a t-shirt as well. So really it is sort of a festival atmosphere that players come for the weekend, they're there the whole time, socialising, getting some, getting some really great games and um, yeah, making it a weekend not to forget for everyone. So yeah, so I've kind of outlined, I've got next steps as my next thing there, but I've kind of sort of run through those. So. As mentioned, it's for a club, it's it's a case of deciding um, is this something that you, you want to offer to bring more people into the game um, and to grow your club with. We recognise that some, some clubs don't have that capacity, but we really want to help clubs that, that can and are keen to, to grow and, and give it a shot. Um, and the district administrators are also going to be um, a great asset as well. So we're working closely with them to make sure that the gear is available, um, that we can find people to run demo nights um, if they wish. So that kind of concludes what, what we had to share and what we've um, and what our launch of, of Racquetball was. So I just want to, want to leave the floor open a little bit more in case there's any more questions to come through. Excellent. John, John, I, I don't have a question, but maybe something that uh, wasn't touched on uh, that much in the presentation, and that is uh, around uh, juniors. So, you know, we're saying we don't want to, we're not trying to um, take away from the squash world, the squash players to play squash 57. Um, there's lots of opportunities to bring in uh, non-squash players onto the squash court, and, and that is particularly true for juniors as well. So I, I think we have a number of um, uh, anecdotal evidence that uh, if you take a, a, a year of uh, like school kids, like 12 year olds, and you put them on a squash court with squash equipment, there's, there's not going to be many of them who are going to be able to actually get a rally going and, and be you know, have so much fun that they're going to be coming back on a regular basis. But if you put them on the court with uh, squash 57 equipment, um, it's much more within their immediate grasp to get a rally going and, and have a, some immediate fun. And, and if you get them into your clubs, playing squash 57 then you actually have them there as a captive audience so when their abilities change as they you know being juniors they they progress at different rates um you've you've got your captive audience whereas if you haven't got them on the court uh, uh if you don't capture them first time playing squash they're going to be going off and playing football or something else so i think that's a it's a it's a very real market for us yeah, yeah, you did right. And we know there's most clubs are pretty experienced. A lot of juniors come in for one year for something different to do and to try for that season. And then unless they're really progressing and, and enjoying it, getting some good rallies going, then it's, yeah, can be difficult to retain those. So, yeah, it's certainly a great, 
great opportunity to introduce racquetball um, as part of that program to bring them in. Something else that I thought of, thought about when you were talking as well, Patrick, beforehand around the inclusivity is we actually ran a, um, an open day at the National Squash Centre last year with Parafeet Auckland. Um, so some, I think we had one lady on a on a wheelchair that came onto the court and we were able to get the racquetball gear out and she was able to play around with that and, and enjoyed it. So yeah, it certainly, it really is a game for anyone, <laughs> regardless of, yeah. Um, yeah, any any disability or for for most some people lack of coordination <laughs> they just struggle. <laughs> so yeah. V- very question good for you, Patrick. Um, you talked about the clubs in the UK growing by thirty percent in terms of their club numbers with the introduction of uh, racquetball. Is there any sort of template examples of any of those clubs in terms of what they may have done and the steps that they followed to get that growth through the club? Yeah, it's it's a good question. I, um, Mark Fuller is uh, who runs UK Racquetball. He is producing. He's working with England Squash right now to um, produce a sort of a, a club program to to sort of I guess give give a, a pathway to in, to growing Squash Fifty Seven at their clubs. So I don't think we have uh, that at the moment, but it's it's imminent. Um, for for the club that I play at, uh, we had, I guess, a handful of very enthusiastic Squash 57 players. So we, I guess, had a catalyst to get things happening. And the 30% is coming from court bookings, social court bookings. Um, and these are bookings made by people who only play Squash 57. So it wasn't as though we were asking, what are you going to play today? These are the people who only play Squash 57. Um, so the, the number may be more than that of who of the actual courts being played with squash 57 these are the courts that are played by people who only play squash 57 so they're not we're not haven't stolen those numbers from the squash world yeah you did yeah there are some great resources on that uk racquetball website and yeah like like a lot of clubs it's probably sort of who do you want to target with this program and said you can sort of run you could run junior programs you one targeting sort of young adults or new players or you could target sort of some of the the older players um it really sort of depends come up with a bit of a strategy on who you, who you want to bring into your club through that and then and then target that whether it's through coaching programs or really promoting open club nights for people to come down and try it and then having more opportunities with tournaments so they can sort of see some sort of progression there as well or just yeah as offering it for casual players once people are aware of it and they've tried it they may just want to come along and do some some pay to play bookings Hey John, could we um, grab a couple of demo rackets for the the Dunlops to try them out at the club? Yep, yep. Um, so talk to Stuart. He's got some gear, the Squash Auckland gear, um, that he'll be able to bring down for you. That you can have a try out with. Um, Gerard, I'll touch base with you because I've got something else I want to think run past you with that instead. Cool. Okay. So, that. Cool. Well, if there's nothing else, um, once again, thank you, Patrick, for your time today to come in and, and share share a bit more about Squash 57 and racquetball, and Stuart as well for sharing what Squash Auckland have done. Um, if there's any parting words, Patrick, for how they're going to really make this a success? <laughs> no, I, I think uh, just enjoy it. it. It is a fun game, and 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 I think it it it. it plays to everybody all abilities all skill levels um it's a fun game and and do give doubles a try because uh it's hard not to smile when you're playing that game <laughs> yeah i'll stick in that i don't think we stopped laughing when we were playing it probably we look ridiculous but yeah it was so much fun as well <laughs> excellent all right well, thank you all for your time as i mentioned i'll get a i'll get a recording up for everyone if you want to sort of go back over it but yeah if you have any questions feel free to flick me an email or give me a call or you can touch with your district administrator and we'll help you get it get it going in your club. So thank you all and have a good night. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, John. Thanks, Thanks Patrick. Thanks.